All right. Yeah. And unit one, lesson 18, analyze setting for today. So let me open this up. Put your, put your day, okay? Okay. So for today, by the time we complete this lesson, you'll be able to define the term setting and identify elements of setting. So much like we did with character, uh, much like we did with analyzing plot, same ideas here. We're still dealing with fiction like where we left off um, before the holiday. So we're gonna be looking at some fiction, fictional writing today. Okay, let me play the audio. Here we go. A story setting is the place and the time in which it is Authors create a setting for details, such as scenery, items found in a room, or characters' clothing and ways of speaking. The setting adds depth and complexity to a story, often foreshadowing events. A story that takes place in the middle of the night in an isolated place, for example, is likely to have a different feel to it than a story set in a high school cafeteria. So setting is just as important as <clears throat> the characters involved in the plot. It, it, it sets the mood. Um, so I saw the new Spider-Man movie on Saturday and I won't give anything away, no spoilers, that, that they actually show some of this in, in the trailer. So um, at one point, Peter Parker, he's going to visit Dr. Strange uh, and he's going to Strange's house, the Sanctum Centaurum, whatever it's called in the, in the comics. And he walks in, right? It's just, it's, it's on, a, on a New York street and he opens the door and he walks in and it's snowing inside the house. And of course he's, you know, Peter has this weird look on his face and it's not like, you know, there's no roof or anything. It is literally snowing inside the house and there's snow everywhere. And <laughs> there's two people over on the side and they're shoveling up the snow and they just kind of stop and they look up at Peter and then they just go back to shoveling the snow and uh dr strange comes down the stairs and he's got his coffee mug and he's wearing you know like a, a coat and and his uh, like sweat you know hoodie and a coat and some sweatpants and it's it, it's not, it doesn't phase him at all you know that it's snowing inside his house and then later they they talk about it's like oh you know one of our portals or whatever opened up here and there was a blizzard that blew through um and it sets the it it, it, it it's the setting does a couple things um, in this case, whether you're reading it or you're, you know, seeing it on TV or in a movie. In that instance, when, when Peter walks into that room and it's snowing inside a house, first of all, you understand that, you know, th this is unusual. And it tells you that unusual things happen here in this place, in this setting. Um, you know, it, it, it's extraordinary to Peter when he walks in. The way Doctor Strange and the other people react to it tell you that while it's extraordinary for Peter, this is fairly ordinary for them. So that sets the tone, right? It's the setting there. This is this is really crazy. Something like this is happening, but it depends on who you are. So it's telling you about the setting that lots of strange things happen, and they happen so much that everybody is used to them. So. That setting that and that that leads into other, uh, you know, that that uh, events that are going to take place there and the magic and things like that. So that's all about setting, you know, good writers set a mood. They, they, they tell you about the scene um, and that adds to the story that they're telling. OK, um, so I'll read through our, our first section here. Uh, this is uh, Kane from the novel Kane by Gene Toomer. And it says a full moon. Up from the skeleton stone walls, up from the rotting floorboards and the solid hand-hewn beams of oak and of the pre-war cotton factory, dusk came up. Up from, lost my place. Up from the dusk, the full moon came, glowing like a fired pine knot it illuminated the great door and soft showered and soft showered the Negro shanties aligned along the single street of factory town. The full moon in the great door was an omen. 
Negro women improvise songs against its spell. The slow rhythm of her, Louisa's, song grew agitant and restless. Rusty black and tan spotted hounds lying in the dark corners of porches or prowling around backyards put their noses in the air and caught its tremor. They began to plaintively yelp and howl. Chickens woke up and cackled. Intermittently all over the countryside, dogs barked and roosters crowed as if heralding a weird dawn or some ungodly awakening. Uh, and it says uh, at the top here, details in the setting affect the feeling of a story. Here, the glowing moon, the glowing full moon, howling dogs and crowing roosters create a mood of restlessness, even agitation, right? There's a tension in the setting. Um, and secondly, it says details about setting can provide clues about a character. Here, the skeleton of the factory and the glowing full moon describe the setting and help explain the woman's reaction to it. So, uh, you know, the same way we talk about characters a lot of times, the way we may describe their physical appearance, uh, you know, the, a setting itself is much like a character and it breathes life into uh, a story. So, Let's take a look here. We'll move over to our quiz. So open up unit one, lesson 18 quiz. We'll start that. And as always, we start with the same piece or same paragraphs there. And it says making assumptions. So authors sometimes describe a setting from a character's point of view. In these instances, the setting can help you understand the character's feelings and state of mind, right? So um, if you set a tense situation like that, you expect the uh, characters to react similarly, right? If it's a tense situation you're setting, uh, but not always, right? If they are acting out of character, well, not out of character, but if they're acting like nothing's wrong, that tells you something about the character. If somebody were just to breeze through a setting like we just, like I just read, and nothing's wrong, that character is going to stand out. So that might be something that you look for in, in reading is how a character reacts to a setting. That's helping develop that character and help develop the setting. Okay. So our first question. Uh, Grace, could you take number one for us, please? Okay. Um, number one. In the second paragraph, Louisa begins singing. How does the description of the setting contribute to the reader's understanding of Louisa's state of mind? The details suggest that she believes, A, singing, singing is a good way to bring sleep. B, the cotton factory, the cotton factory will burn. See, animals grow, grow restless at dusk. And D, some misfortune is about to occur. D? Yeah, some misfortune is about to occur, right? It's a tense setting. It's, it's, it's you know, like it says, it's, it's agitating. The, the, the reader, uh, it should kind of grip you like that, that something's about to happen. And singing, you know, Louisa's singing, uh, as it says, the slow rhythm of her song, agitant and restless. So, you know, if somebody is nervous, uh, you know, they might hum, they might whistle, or, you know, sing. So, and it may grow more, you know, uh, tense as well. And, in, 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 you know, the, you, you can hear their stress in the way they hum or sing or they whistle as well. So that's what that's kind of alluding to there. Okay. Uh, and so we're going to have a fill in the blank question here. Um, see, Tracy, could you read Hook Leaves the Nest for us? Yes. Hook Leaves the Nest. Um, hooks. The hawk's trial was hatched 
in a dry spin among the oaks beside the seasonal river and was struck from the nest early. In the trout, his shingle wheeled parents had to extend their hunting ground by more than twice for the ground, for the ground creatures upon which they fed died and thrice by the hundreds. The range became too great, too great for them to wish to return and feed hooks. And when they had lost interest in each other, they drove hook down into the sand and brush and went back to solitary courses over the bleaching hills. Thanks. Yeah, so that's from Hook by Walter Van Tilber Clark, um, which is a short story. And of course, they're talking about you know, Hook as a character. He, he's a hawk. He's a, he's a, uh, a, a uh, I don't know if he's a baby, but he's, he's too young to actually leave the nest at this point. Um, and of course, the the setting that they're they're showing here is a dry spring, um, so a drought. What they mean by single willed parents is that they have this sort of tunnel vision. They're uh, very uh, focused on finding food. Uh, single willed parents, their hunting ground has expanded because of the drought. They they can't find food. And it's, you know, mentions that it's like uh, upon which they fed, died uh, and dried by the hundred. So there's, there's, you know, oh, I, I don't know if it's supposed to be a desert, but they're, they're in a drought. So there's not much living there. Uh, so then the range came too great for them to, to wish to return and feed hook. They're really struggling to find food. That leads to them kicking them, kicking hook out of the nest. So, our question here says uh, the blank caused his parents to extend their hunting ground, uh, mm -hmm. making it difficult for them to return and feed hook. So what goes in the blank there? Drought. The drought, right? Yeah. D-R-O-U-G-H-T. So due to the drought, they're unable to, you know, feed hook. So he's a burn at that point. Um, and they're gonna basically kick him out. All right. Um, so let's split this up a little bit here. Uh, we have a new passage about Hook. Uh, Hook survives alone. So just even when we're talking about setting, when we're talking about character, make sure you take note of the title. Um, Christiana, would you like to read the first paragraph for us? Okay. Hawk survives alone, unable to fly yet. Hawk creeps over the ground, challenging all large movement with the recalled head. Erect, erected. Uh, Rudimentary. Rudimentary, rudimentary wing and the small wraps, wraps of, of his. I put that word. Clattering? Small rasp it's, of clattering. Okay. Clattering big. It was during this time of abysmal. Abysmal. Okay, abysmal ignorance and continually fear that his eye look on the first quality of a hawk. That's that of being wide. Wide, alert, and challenging. He drought because because of his helplessness, 
among the rattling bush, which grew between the, the old oak and the river. Even in his case, and near the river, the white sun was the dominant present, except in the dawn, except in the dawn when the land wind stirred, or, or in the late afternoon when the sea wind become became strong enough to penetrate the half mile inland island in his turn in the water, in the river. The sun was the major fault and everything was dry and motional, motionless under it. Okay, yeah, um, so a couple, you know, a lot of words you might not be familiar with. Um, and so in the first part, what it's talking about here, uh, hook crept over the ground, challenging all large movements with recoiled head, erected rudimentary rings and small rasp of his clattering beak. So, um, you know, picture how a bird moves. That's what it's going for there. So uh, recoiled head. So, you know, you think about a bird that they, you know, they'll peck at something and, and they, you know, quickly sort of, you know, move their head back. Um, after and when they encounter something, you know, a lot of a lot of wild animals do that, right? They 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 tentatively approach something and they'll pull back. Um, and really, what that whole paragraph there is describing is how he's leaning into his instincts as a hawk, right? The first quality of a hawk, that of being wide, alert, and challenging. He's he's learning to survive on his own in that in that first passage. This is what it's really talking about. Um, Sasha Gay, you want to read the second paragraph for us? The two spacious zones of, of his life environed Hook at this time. One was the great rustle of the slopes of yellowed wild wheat with over it the clattering, the chattering rustle of the leaves of the California oaks already as harsh as individually Tremo. tremulous tremulous is an odd is as in odd autumn autumn the other was a distant whisper of the foaming edge of the pacific punctuated by the follow by the hollowing shores of the wave but these but these hook did not yet hear, for he was attuned by fear and hunger to the small spasmodic rustling of live things. Dry, shrunken, and nearly starved, and with his plumage delayed, he snatched a beetle. He snatched at beetles, dragging dragging in the sand to catch them when swifter and stronger birds and animals did not reach them first which sold which was seldom he ate the small silver fish left in the mud by the falling river by the failing river according to the details in the passage passage where does the hawk live a on a beach, on the beach, B on an island, C in the high prairie, D near the Pacific Ocean. Is it B? D. Yeah. D. D is in dog. Yeah. We have reference here. First off, we you know we see California, uh, California oak. So that's we know that's on the coast. But then the other was a distant whisper of the foaming edge of the Pacific. So in one direction, he's looking at sort of a, a plain, like, a, you know, yellow, yellowed wild wheat. So a field of wheat 
and then on the in the other direction is the Pacific Ocean. So you could turn around, you could see the ocean there. So yeah, so D near the Pacific Ocean. And so four, um, Grace, you want to read number four? Please, did you say Grace? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. The narrator describes the small podemic rustlings of living things and their swifter and stronger birds and animals. Uh, the narrator mostly like the narrator most likely mentions these details about the setting to a describe beauty of nature. B explain the nature has many sights, sights and sounds. C emphasize hooks can eyesight and hearing. And D create a feeling of impending danger to hook. Z B or C. D. D. Yeah. Oh. So <clears throat> right, the small spasmodic, spasmodic rustlings. So spasmodic is like twitchy, you know. Uh, and it looks, you know, sort of like, you know, the, the movement of, of Hook's head, you know, the, the recoil. Um, and it's it's contrasting that uh, with swifter and stronger birds and animals, so predators, right? That first half is prey, small spasmodic rustlings of living things, swifter and stronger birds and animals, predator and prey. Hook is somewhere in the middle, right? He could very easily be a uh, prey for a, a stronger bird or a stronger animal. Um, but he himself is a hawk, so he is a predator. Um, so you, that's, that's the world that he's living in. There's, there's impending danger for him as he tries to survive in this world. All right, so D as in dog or number four. And that's it for the quiz. So one was D as in dog. Uh, two was drought, D-R-O-U-G-H-T. Three was D and four was D. So they're all D and even our words started with D. So two is drought, the rest were all D. Okay, <coughs> so let's take a look at the workbook. Okay. And it says here, an author constructs a setting through the details that describe a place and time the plants to grow in a particular spot or the dialect of characters, speech, for example, helps readers imagine where the story takes place. Uh, a setting can affect the way characters think and behave. Some characters are at ease in a setting while others are not. That's what I mentioned before, right? Um, that helps you, that's <clears throat> also developing a character. That's, that's another way you can analyze a character is how they're reacting in a setting, a particular setting. So a setting also affects the story's feeling or mood. For instance, a place that appears barren or difficult to live in creates a different feeling from a setting that is lush and fertile. So just like our, our bird here, Hook, if he was in a different environment, the danger to him is less, right? It's not going to be the same if, he, if it's a sunny uh, day in, you know, a, a, a uh, in, in the woods after after a rain, right? Then he has more opportunities. It's going to be easy for him to survive. So setting is super super important in um, establishing what's going to happen to characters, and and it gives you that, like I said, uh, foreshadowing. Um, so that's all really really important. Okay. <clears throat> So I'll read off the top one here. So this is Sugarcane Landscape uh, from Blood Burning Moon. Again, this is from, from Kane by Gene Toomer. The thing about Kane, it was interesting, is it was all these, it, it's a novel, but it's these very, all, almost, uh, uh, they, they read almost like short stories as you go through. Uh, it says, up from the deep dusk of a cleared spot on the edge of the forest, a mellow glow arose and spread fanwise into the low-hanging heavens. And all around the air was heavy with the scent of boiling cane. A large pile of cane stalks lay like ribbon shadows upon the ground. So just 
insert here, you know, when they're talking about cane, they're talking about sugar cane, right? They're talking about the big cane stalks um, upon the ground. So a mule harnessed to a pole trudged lazily round and round the pivot of the grinder. Beneath a swaying oil lamp, a Negro alternately whipped out at the mule and fed cane stalks to the grinder. A fat boy waddled pails of fresh ground juice between the grinder and the boiling stove. Steam came from the copper boiling pan. The scent of cane came from the copper pan and drenched the forest and the hill that sloped to factory town beneath its fragrance. It drenched the men seated, seated around the stove. Um, and our first text there, talking about the underlying sentence, the underlying sentence and phrases show the author's use of sensory details, uh, details that appeal to the five human senses to create the setting. So that's the other thing you're going to use, right? Of course, your 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 what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you what you feel, all of those can come into play when describing a scene or describing a setting, like it does here, right? All around the air was heavy. Right, that's a sense of touch, uh, and then the scent of boiling cane, so that the smell of boiling sugar, uh, that sweet smell, and then a large pile of cane stalks lay like ribbon shadows upon the ground. So that's appealing to multiple senses, right? It's, it's your sense of uh, uh, touch, your sense of smell, and and your sight. And uh, next, it says. During the 1800s and early 1900s, sugarcane plantations around the world relied on forced and cheap labor. Here, the description contrasts the sweetness of the cane with the poverty of the workers. So, yeah, sugar production was one of the uh, where slave labor uh, was was utilized. Um, probably, I don't want to um, probably the most. It certainly was in, in, in the in the Caribbean islands, um, and in uh, you know, of course, in, in the U.S., it was more cotton production. There was a little bit of sugar cane. There was a little bit of rice, uh, but in the Caribbean islands, where it was a little bit warmer, uh, and in parts of South America, that was largely the work of your slave labor, and that's one reason they use slave labor because this work was brutal. Um, you, your life expectancy was not very long uh, working uh, in sugar production. And you could see why, you know, they kind of mentioned here, it's hot, um, it, you know, and it's, it, it's in a hot environment already. You know, if you're working in, in, in like uh, the, you know, the Caribbean um, and on top of that, you're working around boiling sugar cane, you're working around heat, um, really, really horrible conditions. And what that's saying here is this, this, this juxtaposition between the smell, which is going to be really sweet. You know, imagine like living next to a, a sugar plantation or something. There's always a sweet smell in the air. Um, and but and, and you're going to smell like that. Right. If you, if you work in an industry, you, you, you know, you're going to have that stick to you. Um, and it's just it's just kind of irony that this luxury item of sugar at the time uh, is is being created by it, this process of just these horrible working conditions. So that's really what it's going for there. Contrast the sweetness of the product with the horrible working conditions that it comes from. All right. So let's start the workbook. And our same piece here. So what says here using logic? So note that the author's use of phrases with similar connotations or reader associations. Low hanging heavens, air was heavy, uh, ribboned shadows. These words provide clues about the setting, right? That's, that's all descriptive words um, talking directly about the setting. So, um, Number one, Tracy, would you like to read question one for us? Yes. Uh, the details of the setting reveal A, an oppressive environment, B, a modern farming operation, C, the sweetness of the land, D, the narrator's love of agriculture. A, a B, the modern farming farming operation. A, 
yeah, you're you're, you're right. You you your instinct was right when when you went to it. Uh, it's an impressive environment, right? Um, lots, of, you know, especially that the the air was heavy. You know that that gives you the impression that stuff's weighing down on somebody. The air itself is pressing down on you. So uh, yeah, A for number one, and number two. Let's see, yeah, we got the same passage here. Um, Christiana, you want to read question two for us? Um, okay. Question two, the description of the certain helps explain why A, the mo molly was wiped. B, the fat boy carries the pills, the pills. Um, C, the man, Feel, feel trapped. D. The molly triggers it. Triggers. Triggers. Trudges. Is that what? Is that is what? Triggers. Trudges. Okay, trudges. Lazily. Mm. Is it the? Is it D or? D or A? It's actually, it's C. It's C. So the whole description is, is sort of lending itself as to, uh, you know, this is not something that's going to be easy to escape. Um, it's, it's a life, uh, it's a hard life, and it's one that you're trapped in. So, yeah, C is in cat for number two there. So even the mule is being... Right, it's 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 a situation. You know, the mule's tied and it's grinding the cane. Okay, and so we got a new passage here. Uh, Sasha, Sasha Gay, you want to read paragraph one for us? Okay. Life on the divide near Rattlesnake Creek on the side of the of a little draw stood Kenny's shanty. North, east, south stretched the level Nebraska, stretched the level Nebraska plain of long rust red grass that un undulated constantly in the wind. To the west, to the west, the ground was broken and rough, and the narrow strip of timber would wound along the turbine, turbid, muddy little stream that had scarcely ambition enough to crawl over the black bottom, over its black bottom. If it had not been for the few stunted cottonwood, and elms that grew along its banks, Canute would, Canute would have shot himself years ago. The Norwegians are a timber-loving people, and if there is even a turtle pond with a few plum bushes around, few plum bushes around it, may, they seem irresistibly drawn toward it. Uh, Grace, you want to read paragraph two? Yeah. As to Shanti itself, Canute had built it without aid of any kind. For him, he first squatted along the banks of Rattlesnake Greek there. There was not a human being within 20 miles. It was built of logs split in halves and chains stopped with mud and plaster. The roof was covered with earth and was supported by one gigantic beam curved in the shape of a round arc. We'll go ahead and read the question too. Okay. Which statement verifies the view from 
Canute house. Hey, the house looks out on grassy plains. B, nothing but mud surrounds the house. C, Canute can see the river on the eastern side. And D, the view in one direction is different from the others. Mm. Is it is it D? D is in dog. And it mentions here, right? So northeast south uh, stretch the level Nebraska plain of long spread grass that undulated closely in the wind. So it's you know going back and forth. Um, and then to the west, the ground was broken and rough and a narrow strip of timber wound along the turbid, muddy little stream that had scarcely ambition enough to crawl over its black bottom. So yeah, so when one direction, it's a plain with grass and the other one, it's sort of a creek and it's rocky and, and there's some timber. So two different directions there. Very good. All right, uh, Tracy, you wanna read number four? Yes. Number four, the question. Yeah. Which, which statement best describe the effect of the setting on cannot <clears throat> A, everything but the three makes him deeply depressed. B, he enjoys living a rough uh, outdoor life deprived the wind. C, his house gives him a sense of comfort and accomplishment. D, the bear, three less than cat makes him miss city life. Um, uh, Uh, I don't know, maybe B, D. No, D. So it's A. A. Yeah, and the clues here. Um, so it's obvious that Canute is Norwegian, right? Because they mentioned this. Norwegians are a timber loving people. And if there is even a turtle pond within a few plum bushes around it, they seem irresistibly drawn toward it. Uh, so, you know, they like the woods, right? Timber being wooded area. Uh, and that's not really what's, there's not a lot of that around where, you know, in, in the one direction, it's all, uh, or in three directions, it's all Nebraska plain. So if you think about Nebraska, it's all flat, not a lot of wooded area, mostly plains. So A for number four, all right. And got a few short passages here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and read the first one then I'll hand it off. So a childhood remembered. A wigwam of weather-stained canvas stood at the base of some irregularly ascending hills. A footpath wound its way gently down the sloping land till it reached the broad river bottom. Creeping through the long swamp grasses that bent over it on either side, it came out on the edge of the Missouri. Uh, Christiana, you want to read the second paragraph there? Okay. Um, here, morning, noon, and evening, and evening, my mother came. My mother came to draw water from the muddy stream for our household use, household use. Always when my mother starts for, for the river, I stopped my play to run along with her. Uh, Sasha Gay, you wanna read the next one? I was a wild little girl of seven, loosely clad in a slip of brown box skin and a light footed and light footed with a pair of soft moccasins <clears throat> on my feet. I was as free as the wind that blew my hair and no less spirited than a bounding deer. These were my mother's pride, my wild freedom and overflowing spirits. She taught me 
no fear, no fear, save that of intruding myself upon others. Go ahead and read the question too. Which description best reflects the landscape? A, a hilly, A, hilly on the edge of a river, D, B, dry and flat with little water, C, rich cultivated farmland, D, dense forest untouched by humans, A, yeah, A, it's a uh, hilly on the edge of a river. And of course, when they say the Missouri, they're, they're talking about the Missouri River there, right? So, uh, you know, gently down the sloping land till it reaches the broad river bottom, uh, some irregularly ascending hills. So all that setting a scene of, of hills <clears throat> and you have the river there too. So A uh, for number five, okay. And number six, let's see. Grace, you want to read number six for us? <clears throat> okay. The girl's home and clothing revealed that she most likely lives a, in a small river town in Missouri, be near a big Midwestern city in the 1880s. See, in a rural Native American community. And D in a windy area, heavily populated by deer. A. So it's C. C. Yeah. Um, so a couple clues there, right? Uh, first off, we didn't mention the title. Well, I mean, uh, we have the title up here for just that passage as a child had remembered. But if we look at the actual title that the passage came from, it's impressions of an Indian childhood. So, you know, that's tipping you off that we're talking about Native Americans. Uh, and then uh, if you think about the way she's dressed, right? Loosely clad in a slip of brown buckskin. Buckskin is like a, you know, deer skin. So she's got like a little deer skin dress on and her little, you know, soft moccasins on her feet. Um, so that's, you know, kind of tipping you off there. This must be a Native American community. Uh, so yeah, C is in cat for number six. Um, Tracy, you wanna read number seven for us? Yes. How does the girl's behavior reflect the setting? A, the girls had no interest in the outdoors and refers reading. B, the mother is worried that the girls is too free to wander in the woods. C, the girl is free spirit like the wind and the deer. D, the girl accent reflect the gentle flow of the river. C, the girl is a free spirit like a wind and the deer. Yep, C is in cat, right? Uh, that's, it says, you know, her, um, her mother's pride. So her mother's happy about her, her behavior, you know, my wild freedom and overflowing spirits. Uh, she taught me no fear, save that of intruding myself upon others. So uh, you know, just being mindful of how she acts around others, but she enjoys her free spirit. Um, so C is in cat for number seven. Okay. And the bread line from a deal in wheat uh, from 1902. Let's see, I'll go ahead and read the first paragraph here. The street was very dark and absolutely deserted. It was a district on the south side, not far from the Chicago River, given up largely to wholesale stores and after nightfall was empty of all life. But slight bouts and the slightest footfall, the faintest noise woke them upon the instant and sent them clamoring up and down the length of the pavement between the iron shuttered fronts. The only light visible came from the side door of a certain Deanna bakery, where at one o'clock in the morning, loaves of bread were given away to any who should ask. Every evening about nine o'clock, the outcasts began to gather about the side door. The stragglers came in rapidly and the line, the bread line, as it was called, began to form. By midnight, it was usually some hundred yards in length, stretching 
almost the entire length of the block. Uh, Christiana, you want to read the next one? Number two. Okay. Um, toward 10 in the evening, his colors turn up against the fine drizzle that pervaded the air. His hand, his hands in his pockets, his elbows gripping his side, his side. Some laws. Uh, what was the name? Lewiston, Sam Lewiston. Okay, Sam Lewiston came up and silently took his place at the end of the line. Um, Sasha Gay, you want to read number three? He stood now in the unfolding drizzle, sudden top field with fatigue before and behind stretched the line. There was no talking, there was no sound, the street was empty. It was still, it was so still that the passing of the cable car, of a cable car in the adjoining thoroughfare grated like prolonged rolling explosions, beginning and ending at immeasurable distances. The drizzle descended incessantly after a long time midnight struck. Uh, Grace, you want to finish off the last paragraph? Okay. There was something ominous and gravely, gravely impressive in this interminable line of dark figures, close praised, soundless, a crowd yet absolutely still, a close packed, silent file, waiting, waiting in the vast deserted night riding street, street, waiting without a word without a movement, there under the night and under the slow moving mist of rain. Go ahead and read the question too. Okay. Which phrase best describes the setting in this passage? A, poor and rural, rural. B, poor and urban. C, worthy and cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan. Yeah, you had it, cosmopolitan. <laughs> and D, mid, middle class and residential. Is it A? Definitely. Oh, no. I'm sorry. B. <laughs> B. Yeah, B, as in boy, poor and urban. So it's definitely poor, right? Because we're talking about a bread line. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we're, we're seeing people waiting to, to get bread. So that's showing you poor. And then, uh, you know, some of the tip offs that it's urban, uh, things like the uh, the 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 cable car right it was still so it was so still that the the passing of a cable car in the adjoining thoroughfare graded so that's telling you it's it's you know it, that's a very urban idea if you're having like that type of, of mass transit through a city Chicago River of course right so South Side those are all words that you that you uh, associate with an urban area B as a boy poor and urban uh, Tracy, you want to read question nine for us? Yes. I go past, there we go. In this passage, how does the sex story affect the feeling or mood of the story? The setting makes the mood A, active and purposeful, B, warm and in, in, inviting. C, distant and order worthy, D, gloom and forbidding. Um, distant, C, distant and order worthy. So it's D. Gloomy. So, yeah, gloomy and forbidding, right? So I could see where that, that uh, distant and otherworldly, you know, it does kind of play that way a little bit, but um, we're also, if you think about the um, the, the stragglers, 
uh, and, and how Sam, you know, is approaching the line. He's sort of, you know, with his elbows close to his sides because it's, you know, you can kind of think of it as cold outside and his hands in his pockets, his elbows gripping his sides. Um, uh, it's quiet too, right? You can, the, the passing of the cable car and the, the grinding of the cable car as it passes. So very gloomy and, and forbidding in that way. So D for number nine. Okay. And uh, let's see, 10. Christiana, you want to read question 10 for us? Okay. <laughs> the question says, to which location would a man in some frosting condition be most likely go to? A, a shelter. B, a park bench. C, a restaurant. D, another Bakery. Is it D? Uh, it's A. So it's implying that, you know, Sam is somebody that's maybe destitute, it's fallen on hard times, uh, maybe homeless, uh, you know, if he's standing in a bread line. But it, this would, it all implies that he would probably need other help. Uh, so he may need to go to like a shelter. So 10 A. <clears throat> and so the bread line again here for 11. Sasha Gay, you want to read 11 for us? What can you conclude from the details about the south side? The neighborhood is probably A, a gritty business district, B, an upscale warehouse district, C, a suburban destination. D, D, a performing arts district. I'm not sure what gritty means. So it's it's A, right? A gritty business district. So you know, it's it's not a. If you if you think about the setting, uh, you know, where it, for starters, if it's a bread line. So it's probably not going to be somewhere upscale. It's not going to be, you know, in a suburban area, probably not in a performing arts, you know, mm -hmm. district where you would have, you know, more well-to-do people, right? This is going to be somewhere sort of out of sight and out of mind for, you know, where, where, where your, your middle class and above would see it. Um, so that leaves basically a gritty business district. And you can kind of get that from, from some of the other points here. Um, iron mm -hmm. shuttered fronts. The only light visible came from the side door of a certain Vienna bakery where at one o'clock in the morning, loaves of bread were handed out. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of the echoes slept, but lightly hereabouts and the slightest footfall, the faintest noises woke them upon the instant. Uh, a lot here, you know, kind of leads to a sort of grittiness and, and a sort of a dirty business kind of district. So A for number 11, okay. Um, let's see, Tracy, you wanna read number 12 for us? Yes, how, how does the description of the weather and the overall effect on the passage? A, it's, it shows the attitude of the man is B, it heightens the difficulty of making the black. See, it emphasizes the discomfort, discomfort of the characters. D, it contrasts with the gloominess of the stress C. Yeah, uh, obviously, you know, C, right? It's definitely adding that effect of the discomfort. Uh, it's gloomy, it's, it's, the weather's gross, you know, it, it's making everybody feel uncomfortable. So on top of, you know, the setting itself being kind of dark and gloomy and gritty, bad weather is gonna add, add to that feeling. And, 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 and just, you know, kind of make everybody else miserable as well that's in that setting. Okay, um, we're getting kind of short on time. I'm gonna go ahead and read our passage here and uh, we'll, we'll try to finish up here, make sure we get out at three. 
so a salesman gets help with his car. This is from The Death of a Traveling Salesman. Um, really famous play here. So, uh, I done got your car out, mister, said Sonny's voice in the dark. She's setting a waiting in the road, turned to go back where she come from. Fine, said Bowman, projecting his own voice to loudness. I'm surely much obliged. I could never have done it myself. I was sick. I could do it easy, said Sonny. Bowman could feel them both waiting in the dark, and he could hear the dogs panting out in the yard, waiting to bark when he should go. He felt strangely helpless and resentful. Now that he could go, he longed to stay. For what was he being deprived? His chest was rudely shaken by the violence of his heart. These people cherish something here that he could not see. They withheld some ancient promise of food and warmth and light. Between them, they had a conspiracy. He thought of the way she had moved away from him and gone to Sonny. She had flowed toward him. He was shaking with cold. He was tired, and it was not fair. Humbly and yet angrily, he stuck his head into his pocket. Of course, I'm going to pay you for everything. We don't take money for such, said Sonny's voice belligerently. I want to pay, but do something more. Let me stay tonight. He took another step toward him, toward them. If only they could see him, they would know his sincerity, his real need. His voice went on. I'm not very strong yet. I'm not able to walk far, even back to my car, maybe. I don't know. I don't know exactly where I am. You ain't no revenuer, tax collector. Come sneak in here, mister. Ain't, gone, ain't got no gun. To this end of nowhere, and yet he had come, he made a grave answer. No, you can stay. So, um... I'll go ahead and finish this out here. So 13, Sonny says that Bowman's car is setting a waiting in the road. Sonny's statement reveals that the story most likely takes place A, at a shopping mall, B, in a foreign country, C, in a big city, or D, in the country. So the answer is D, right? D. You, there you go. Yeah. So D is a dog because you can tell by the accent that's being portrayed, right? And, and his, his diction, the way he talks. Uh, that's, you know, I had done got your car out, mister. She's setting a waiting in the road, turned to go back where she came from. So same thing. She's setting in the road, kind of implied that it's probably a country setting. You're not going to leave your car out in the road. It's in the city. And 14... What does Bowman's reaction to the setting reveal about his presence there in paragraph four? Let's look at paragraph four. So uh, Bowman could feel them both waiting in the dark. He could hear the dogs panting out in the yard. Um, so A, Sonny has given Bowman travel directions. B, Bowman is vacationing in the area. C, Bowman is not there by choice. Or D, Sonny has invited Bowman to the region. What do we think happens here? C. Yeah, it definitely sounds like Bowman is not there willingly. Oh, I'm sorry, C. C is in cat. Yeah, right? C. Yeah, Bowman is not there by choice. Uh, something's happened, his car's broken down. He's not there of his own accord. 15. So the narrator says that Bowman could hear the dogs panting out in the yard, waiting to bark at him. How is this detail about the setting significant? Uh, A, it suggests that Bowman is in immediate danger. B, it contributes to the unwelcome feeling that Bowman has. C, it gives the image of a typical family's home and pets. Or D, it adds to the feeling of the isolation of the location. So the dogs panting in the yard. Is it B? Yeah, B, right? There's an unwelcome feeling that Bowman has. Okay, and our final question here, wrapping up. So Bowman describes the setting as this end of nowhere, right here in paragraph nine, to this end of nowhere. And yet he had come, he had made grave answer no. So what does this description reveal about Bowman's reaction to the setting? A, is Bowman finds the setting charming and relaxing, uh, relaxing. B, the setting is remote and completely foreign to Bowman. C, Bowman thinks his arrival in the setting is a fine adventure. Or D, the setting reminds Bowman of a place in which he was raised. Is it B? 
be he is a boy right in the middle of nowhere that usually describes somewhere that's foreign this end of nowhere as he says so be is a boy all right so that's the last question there we had quite a few that was a lot to go through. That was 20 questions, including the quiz. Um, did everybody get the answers? Is there anything that anybody was missing there? Everybody okay? Okay. Uh, any questions 